pimp simulator. Ooh, I love this. I've always wanted to simulate being a pimp. Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Business Place. This one is brought to you by the people over at Squarespace. What is Squarespace? Well, you probably don't know. You've probably never heard of Squarespace before. You're like, what is that? Some sort of boxing ring? Why is a boxing ring... A boxing ring is square, right? It definitely is. Why is it called a ring? What is going on? You can get 10% off your first purchase at squarespace.com forward slash blaze legends. Oh, they make websites, by the way. You can make websites with Squarespace. That's what's going on. Welcome back. What happens here is Danny has written me a script. It feels very light today, but I counted the pages and uh, it's eight pages or seven pages. So it's the normal length. Very, very long. Ha! <laughs> Gay! Always. Danny, you don't have to write these so long. Danny, please, please make them shorter. My legs are so tired. Please, Danny. And Danny's like, Simon, here's eight pages again. Get ready for a 40 minute video. And everyone in the comments is always like, Simon, these wouldn't be so long. These wouldn't be so long, Simon, if you didn't add all this bullshit that no one needs. And I'm like, okay. That's absolutely true. Uh, but also, if we had all the bullshit and they were half as long, they'd be half as long still. Why are my glasses so foggy? Am I sweaty? I'm a little bit sweaty. Summer is here. Or spring is here. Or maybe my shirt is just dirty. Dirty mother uh, So, Danny has written me this. I will read it eventually. And then Sam is going to sprinkle in some fine vintage memes. Let's go. An evening falls. Oh, it's a story. I love it when Danny starts with a story. An evening falls over the city of Fruitland in Wicomico County, Maryland, during a tomorrow which is not too far away from today. Mr. and Mrs. Campbell settle down in front of the TV with a plate of hot dogs and pickles. <laughs> Danny is painting a scene of America. President Trump Jr., oh God, is about to give an address to the nation, and the mood appears to be slightly tense as he limps up to the podium, looking disheveled and defeated. He informs the citizens of the United States of America that following a misjudged Zoom meeting with a bunch of other notable leaders of the world, it was eventually decided that the best way of resolving everyone's differences was to engage in a nuclear war and see who was still laughing at the end of it. Nobody, Danny. <laughs> nuclear war, it's like we're all gone. <laughs> Nobody's going to be laughing. Everything is destroyed. I just want to mention, you know, a regular recurring meme on this channel is the fact that the past was the worst. And I read one of my favorite books is Night 63, which I think has a different name, or Dallas 63. One of them is the American name, one of them is the UK name. It's a Stephen King book about a guy who finds a way to go back in time and prevents the Kennedy assassination. It's one of my favorite books. It's wildly good. And there was an interesting mini series made about it, which wasn't as good as the book, which was still exceptional. What are we talking about? Oh yeah, and it kind of really romanticizes the 1950s. And I'm like, the problem with the 1950s, it's just like, everyone was like, why are we getting all these nuclear weapons? <laughs> are we gonna destroy each other with nuclear weapons? Ah, but ho hum, 1950s. It was a better time, except for the impending threat of the end of humanity. The past was the worst, don't forget it. There's now only an estimated 24 hours left before the missiles strike and utterly obliterate America. President Trump Jr. encourages citizens to try and stay upbeat during the difficult time, as the whole thing is strangely beautiful in a way. Upon hearing the news, Mrs. Campbell puts a hot dog back on the plate with a touch of irritation and says, well, it's just bloody typical, isn't it? It's true that Mr. and Mrs. Campbell find the end of the world to be a minor inconvenience that neither of the happy couple are too worried. You see, they were clever enough to invest in a Kickstarter project, which has got them covered for this unexpected nuisance. What is this going to be? Kickstarter nuclear bomb shelters. They've got a spot reserved at a nuclear bunker with some very swanky facilities. The Enduritus project was launched on the platform in 2015 by the Canadian engineer Stephen Lawson. He was seeking a target goal of just under three million Canadian dollars to help build his technologically advanced underground shelter system, which would keep a maximum of 500 VIP guests safe for the first three years of nuclear fallout. Three target goal of just under three million dollars. How on earth? I mean, three million dollars is like, you couldn't get a large flat in London for three million. Maybe you could, but look, three million dollars would buy you a piece of property in a city. I hear Vancouver's expensive. You could probably get like a one bedroom apartment for three million dollars in Vancouver. And this Canadian dude is gonna th thinks he can build like a bomb shelter for 500 people for three million dollars. Where did you get your engineering degree, Stephen? The online university of dumb. Wow, speaking of that, I guess I got my comedy degree at the online university of dumb. Jokes. I'm so shit. <laughs> Please forgive me. You're doing well. <laughs> you need to study your grammar, son. Wow, that was embarrassing for you. 
And this wasn't your bog-standard garden variety nuclear shelter. The Enduritus was targeted at the apocalypse of Iru, was still keen to enjoy the finer things in life after the rest of civilization had been fried to a crisp. It comes with a five-star hotel, a spa with a steam room, a restaurant, a thermal beach, tropical gardens, and very possibly a branch of Taco Bell. The problem is, and this is always, a, this isn't my joke, this isn't my thought, I can't remember where I read it, but whoever came up with this, credit to them, whatever, uh, is when you have these shelters, right, there's 500 people who want, like, Taco Bell, it's like, who's going to be serving the Taco Bell? Is it going to be one of the 500? Is there going to be a service staff? How do I sign up for that? Because I don't want to die. <laughs> it's like, Simon, would you rather be wiped out in nuclear apocalypse or work at Taco Bell in some sort of underground shelter with a thermal beach? And I'll be like, can I use the thermal beach at night when the rich people aren't using it? And they'll be like, no. And I'll be like, okay, I'm in anyway. Welcome to Taco Bell. Oh my god. Can you take your order? <laughs> <laughs> because not dying, barely strong motivation of mine, and I feel most people's. Pepper, I don't want to die. It's too late, George. His presence is already here. <laughs> The Kickstarter page was crammed full of technical drawings and diagrams and pie charts from any clearly knew a thing or two about engineering. I imagine he did anyway, knowing nothing about engineering myself. He might as well have been drawing a blueprint for a left-handed tumble dryer. But <laughs> uh, he also claimed to have already completed phase one of the project, identifying, designing, and engineering all of the individual components for the shelter at a personal cost of 450,000 Canadian dollars. Okay, okay, mate. So you've designed it. And it costs you half a million Canadian dollars. And you just need two and a half more to actually build it? I could design a house on my iPad. It would take me a day. It'd be shit. But if someone wanted to build it, it, was, it would cost more than it cost me to design it. Am I making sense? It feels very low, is what I'm trying to say. It feels very, very low. But here's where the Kickstarter campaign fell down a bit. Even if Mr. and Mrs. Campbell had turned up to Stephen's nuclear bunker with suitcases full of Frey Bentos pies, it's more than likely they would have been turned away because it doesn't state anywhere on the page that making a pledge reserves you a ticket. The only perks on the table are a nice little baseball cap showing a sun rising over the earth at a cost of a thousand thousand Canadian dollars, oh my, and a laminated picture showing all of the system components, which, which is yours, for just under 8,000 Canadian dollars. The baseball cap might look quite nice, but I have serious reservations about whether it's going to help protect you from a nuclear blast. That's not great, but it's not horrifying. Not at all. By the looks of it, Stephen wasn't inviting you along to the proposed nuclear holiday resort. He just wanted you to help fund it for the benefit of himself and maybe 499 mates. Dude, that is as cl I, I, I mean, allegedly. Allegedly, that sounds like they're the con, doesn't it, Stephen? <laughs> doesn't it? That's probably why he only managed to attract one dollar in funding, falling a little short of his projected target. In why does anyone? How did anyone even pay attention to this? He raised a dollar. How did this become a thing? <laughs> it's just that I, I feel like with this kind of, sh it's just like no one's been ripped off. No one cares. Let's just pretend that it doesn't exist because it's just better for everyone. <laughs> it's like no one. I mean, I don't know to rip the piss out of him later. So maybe it's all worthwhile. I guess so. Thank you, Stephen. In later years, it appears Stephen moved his attention to GoFundMe after his life took a bit of a downturn. His wife left him, he got fired from his day job, and he claims that he was now living in his Toyota when just needed about 46,000 Canadian dollars to help him get back on his feet. Get real money. Don't know what board game this came from, but it's a joke. What? <laughs> If I had no money and I was living in a car, I would need slightly less than $46,000 to get back on my feet. I'd be like, wait, what's one month's rent and a deposit? I'd be like, I'll take that, please. Please, anything, like two, three grand, please. That didn't plan out very well either. Still, don't worry, Stephen, it's not the end of the world. And if we dig a bit of a bob and if we dig deep enough, I'm sure we can pick out some other Kickstarter campaigns that bombed just as badly as the Enduritus. Oh boy, can we? Horny Germans. Whatever happens to the shoehorn? Does anybody still use them? I remember shoehorn was a fairly common sight when I was a kid. My older relatives used them all the time, and even I was sometimes shoehorned into my school shoes. The product has a long history dating back to the 15th century, but I feel it's mysteriously disappeared in recent years without any valid explanation or replacement. Danny, do you have a same relationship with a shoehorn as you have umbrellas? Because we did, there was a one, a, a business based script a while ago. Danny was like, yeah, umbrellas are for girls, am I right? And I was like, Danny, I have an umbrella. I have like two umbrellas, like a big one that I keep in the car, and then one of those little pop-out ones, which, unfortunately, is it used to be my wife's. She bought another one because it was too heavy, but it's really high quality and nice. It was very expensive. I mean, I don't know, it was like 30 quid or something. But it's in the shape of a giant purple flower. But being a very confident man, I'm just like, I rock that giant purple flower umbrella. <laughs> What's wrong with me? Maybe we'll just start buying shoes that properly fit our feet instead of trying to squeeze them into a size too small. It's not that they're too small, it's just I don't want to do the laces every time. You're just like, whoop-boo, and on it goes. If the boot 
bits. Okay, cowboy. Not everybody has forgotten them though. In 2016, that a German entrepreneur by the name of Marion Weilgeny came up with the idea of marrying modern technology, the smartphone, to this ancient lost technology, the shoehorn. The, the low cover was a smartphone case which doubled as an emergency shoehorn. Mario was looking for 84,000 pounds, which is. I don't know what, these days, like $90,000, uh, to achieve what seemed to be a remarkably simplistic goal. The promotional video depicted a group of hipsters slipping on their ill-fitting shoes with ease while hanging out at the gym and the nightclub. But I'm still struggling. Why would they be taking their shoes off at a nightclub? Do people... Ah, do women go to a nightclub in trainers and then swap on for their fancy shoes? That's right. And modern problems require modern solutions. Being not a woman, I wouldn't understand such pain. I just wear comfortable shoes all the time, and with men's shoes, the comfortable shoes also look good. But I'm struggling to see why there would be such a great demand for the low cover, even from hipsters. For starters, there's a potential hygiene problem here. Dude, I mean, already though, your mobile phone is a piece of sh hygiene wise. I, I don't know, you're taking a sh it's in there with you, you eat dinner, it's there with you. Like, it's everywhere. It's disgusting. The multifunctional case also serves as a phone stand, but you wouldn't put your dirty trainers on your kitchen table or desktop, so why would you put a phone stand on your table after it's been poking around your smelly feet? Come to think of it, would you really put a used shoehorn right next to your face every time you take a call? I don't know, I don't think it's that dirty. It's that I'm wearing socks, aren't I? I don't really have a problem with this, and I'm like a bit of a germaphobe. But I also feel that shoehorns were never really required to be portable anyway. Whenever I saw a shoehorn, it was always quite kept quite close to a shoe rack, poised for morning duty. There's surely not that many people out there are constantly changing their shoes throughout the day at the bus stop, the supermarket, and down the pub. A, a shoehorn I had for a really long time was just one I nicked from a hotel because it was really nice. And it came in like, it came in the amenities kit, so I was like, can I steal? I, that's, if it's in the amenities kit, it's for stealing. How dare you? That's the rules hotels. Sadly, Marion only managed to squeeze £1,744 from backers before the project slipped off the radar. Still, it's given me an idea for a new smartphone case that doubles up as a pooper scooper. <laughs> I honestly feel like £84,000 is outrageous. Look, maybe there could be a business... We could do business place challenges. I reckon I could get a mobile phone case slash shoehorn designed and made for what? 100 quid? 500 quid? Maybe? Just get someone like... <laughs> Get some graphic designer, graphic designer, like industrial engineer or whatever, to knock one off on Fiverr. Go over to AliExpress or wherever and be like, yo, or Alibaba, wherever. You know, you know what I'm talking about. I don't know how any of this stuff works. It'd be like, yo, can you make me a shoehorn that is like stuck onto a mobile phone case? And they'll be like, yeah. And then we'll ship it and we don't need to charge anyone $84,000 and we'll find out ourselves that no one will ever buy this. But something you should absolutely buy, that is a wonderful and accidental transition. Oh, maybe if we did this, we could have a Squarespace store selling it, because today's video, mm, it is brought to you by Squarespace, from websites and online stores to marketing tools and what? Analytics! Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business selling mobile phone shoehorns. If you've got an idea for a business, this isn't an absolute sh show like a uh, mobile phone shoehorn, uh, then you can absolutely use Squarespace to set up an online store. It's all very easy. I'm in the process of doing this for uh, the Rotting Turtle fragrance, which Danny introduced in a previous thing as something I could never sell. I was like, Danny, au contraire. I believe that I could sell a perfume called Rotting Turtle. It's in development. Samples for the scents are on their way to me right now. By the time this video is out, maybe you can even go to rottingturtle.com and see the Squarespace store that I have designed. Mwah! Uh, even if you don't want to run a store, you can do it for blogs, you could do it for whatever you like. I mean, if you've, you've seen a website out there on the inter... <laughs> I forgot what the internet was called, I was going to call it Website World. <laughs> if you've seen a website on the Website World, well, you can make something similar and probably better looking, to be honest, with Squarespace. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you customize to your little heart's content, or you can start from scratch, or you can move over from an existing domain. On Squarespace, everything is just easier to manage. There's no technical nonsense. There's no, what else isn't there? There's no uh, updates. There's no patches. I mean, I'm sure there are updates and patches, but you don't have to deal with them. It all happens automatically behind the scenes. It's not like other website providers where it's like, don't forget, you've got to update to version 14.1.6.39876.2 slash A41 slash 6 slash 192. No, none of that. Also, podcasts. Yes, mailing lists. Oh yeah, social integrations. Yes, yes, yes. 
and much, much more. Like I say, Squarespace, I haven't said that actually, but Squarespace does remove the excuses to your dreams, so go get started. Squarespace.com forward slash blaze, 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain, repeat call to action. Squarespace.com forward slash blaze, 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain, and let's get into it. <laughs> when I signed up to build the Rotting Turtle site, I was like, can I use my own promo code? And I didn't. <laughs> Because I was like, I don't want to skew the data that Squarespace gets, so I didn't sign up with my own code and I didn't save the 10%. Uh, I probably should have. And they'd also be like, wow, Simon really converts. He sold at least one. Monterey Jack. Pimp Simulator. Ooh, I love this. I've always wanted to simulate being a pimp. I can remember back in the golden age of 8-bit gaming when software labels first realized that sticking the word simulator at the end of a title made a game sound quite technical and serious and advanced. In many cases, it was stretching expectations a little bit too far. BMX Simulator. So it's a BMX game. Pro Powerboat Simulator. Beach Buggy Simulator. They may have sounded quite flashy, but the simple 2D graphics and gameplay may have disappointed anyone expecting some kind of half-authentic simulation for their to quit. I was playing an amazing game that is years old now, but I, this, because this was years ago. But speaking of simulations, there's a game called Beam NG, which is just like, a, a, it's designed to be very realistic. So they have cars and they have all of the axles and wheels and all of this stuff. And it's like, a, the physics sandbox is incredible. So you got this car and it's like, you just crash it into shit. But it's not like on GTA where it's like, you know, your car drives off a cliff, smashes through a bunch of trees, ends up on the highway, gets shot at by police, rolls over six times, magically flips over, and is completely fine except for a little bit of a scratch. This is like, oh no, you, you, you drove it down a step too far and the axle's broken. <laughs> and you're like, it's a bit too realistic, but it is enormously fun. Just getting a car up to like 150 miles an hour and just plowing it into like a... And you can have anything. You can make like a really thin thing. So it's just like, it just wraps around it. And then you can slow it. It's it's golden. If you haven't played it, give it a try. When Whistler Gaming launches, that's what we'll be playing. <laughs> just joking, Whistler Gaming isn't a thing. I've already got 10 channels. Other titles such as Ninja Scooter Simulator and Advanced Lawnmower Simulator were clearly just taking the piss. Fast forward to 2016 and the trend appears to still be live and kicking. Developer William Turchin was working on a new PC game which claimed to shed some insight into the shady life of a typical pimp. <laughs> what is going on? Monterey Jack Pimp Simulator. Isn't Monterey Jack a type of cheese or am I imagining that? Was set in the 3D environment of Pimpadelphia and you could choose to take on the role of a man, a woman. Or a robot pimp. Oh, you're not even a regular pimp, you're a robot pimp. Wow. But weirdly, your character is portrayed only as a single hand on the screen. And quite disturbingly, the only purpose of the game is to wander around the mean streets of the city, slapping everyone in your path. Because yes, in the real world, like simulating... If, we were, if it was a genuine pimp simulator, it would be a horrible insight into the horrors of uh, like unregulated sex work and pimping and all of this stuff. It would be like, wow. This is just, I mean, it'd be like Murder Simulator. <laughs> really just dark and horrible. Is Wayne Brady gonna have to choke a bitch? <laughs> if you like dark and horrible things, you should check out my podcast, The Casual Criminalist, also one of those 10 YouTube channels linked below. I'm no expert, but I'm pretty sure there's more to being a pimp than just randomly attacking everyone you encounter. Yes, Monterey Jack reveals a lifestyle in which the protagonist simply wanders into strip bars and fast food restaurants, punching strippers in the face, picking up waitresses and tossing them over the counter, and occasionally smashing glass bottles over the heads of complete strangers. Later on, it appears that your floating disembodied hand can also develop superpowers to magically remove all the clothing of every innocent pedestrian that you bump into during a fun day out in Pimpadelphia. Don't move to Pimpadelphia. No one would live there. You'd be like, where do you live? Pimpadelphia. It's like, oh. Oh, no! Incidentally, the graphics looked a good 20 years out of days, but I think that's probably the least of the game's problems. Agreed. Perhaps William felt he could avoid any accusations of glorifying violence against women by including an apparently female playable character, but I don't believe that painting the fingernails pink on one of the floating hands really does much to dilute the impact of the game in which the player is largely invited to either brutally assault or undress every woman on the street. Also, William has a very weak understanding of uh, domestic violence if he believes that women can't beat other women or indeed men. It's like, dude, by making that, you've actually just made it worse. <laughs> William managed to raise $305 of the $44,300 that he reckoned he needed to finish the game before the project was suspended from Kickstarter. Good. I feel like we should do GoFundMe. And what's the other one? There's another, like, there's a lot of these crowdfunding platforms. But I think, I feel like Kickstarter is the most regulated. If someone could tell me in the comments, like, or link me to ones on other platforms where it's just like, it's just a sh 
show because they don't shut down. I would like that. Is there a is there a dark web Kickstarter where it's like kick fund my pimp career or something? It's like oh no, kick fund. Maybe it could be called kick fund. Maybe we should start this. FBI, open up! No, Simon, you're not an international criminal. Allegedly. Curiously, the suspension had nothing to do with Kickstarter. Oh, William suspended himself and then went out of his way to wipe the project from existence and pretend it never happened. Maybe he had a change of heart. Probably best to never ever mention it again. I wonder why he had a change of heart. Someone was probably like, dude, that is wildly inappropriate and that's gonna be around, that's gonna follow you around, dude. Someone's gonna want to employ you at some point. You're hired. And then they won't. You're fired. Oh, you're the pimp simulator guy. <laughs> HR are not gonna like this, Willers. Some of the most absurd Kickstarter projects actually end up getting funded. Partic oh wait, was there a title? The piano is the champagne. Weird. Some of the most absurd Kickstarter projects actually end up getting funded, particularly if it's in the name of art. Like that giant paper mache head of Lionel Richie that we covered in a previous video. Oh my god, that was a long time ago. And like in this case of a proposed artistic venture which involved nothing more than the dropping of an old grand piano from a height of 60 feet onto a glass tower constructed entirely of 385 champagne glasses. The art, I mean, that is kind of, I'm, a, I'm such a fucking hipster, I'm like, that is kind of cool. That is kind of cool. And then we can sell it as an NFT, because if there's anything more than a hipster, I'm a capitalist. The artists Roger Pinney and Jonah Emerson Bell were first inspired by a curious thought in 2012. What would a piano crashing into 385 champagne glasses actually sound like? They figured that such a sound had probably never been heard in the history of the earth. And I would imagine they're probably right. And then again, just because I've never heard of a company of hiccuping parrots performing a karaoke version of Oh Danny Boy, accompanied by Yoko Ono on bagpipes, that doesn't mean I've got a burning desire for that to change. Honestly, putting Yoko on the bagpipes is actually doing us a favor, because I mean, bag Bagpipes, I mean, come on. No offense, Scottish people, but what the f And then, but having your, you know, what? That you, um, you had, you, you, you could. One thing they do sound better than? Yoko Ono. And that's the only thing. It's the only thing. I mean, there's like the rankings of like things that are the worst sounding. Down at like 500, you've got Justin Bieber. Then like around 147, you've got, you know, a fat man letting out a wet fart. And then all the way up at number one is our friend Yoko. Rainer and Jonah wondered if the sound generated from their project might resonate with the deepest human impulses for desire and gratification in their own words. Why should Wiley e. Coyote have all the fun? They were seeking $2,300 on Kickstarter to help bring the Piano is the Champagne project to the Gowanus Ballroom in Brooklyn. And quite remarkably, they smashed their goal and ends up breaking in $2,975 worth of funding. If you can buy a old grand piano for a grand, let's say, uh, you know, so you're down to 1,975. You got 385 champagne glasses, and let's say they cost you two dollars each. So that's 1,770, uh, so 1,170 overall. And then let's say you're renting this ballroom. That's going to be in Brooklyn, New York. It's expensive. Let's say that costs you another grand, 2,770. Then you've got actually this is actually spot. I was like, it can't be that cheap, and I'm like, no, it's pretty spot on. It's probably quite spot on. But as Sam should be able to show us about now, the first attempt just fell a little flat. Despite the impressive turnout and thrilling countdown from 10 by an excited crowd of art lovers, the grand piano appeared to suffer from stage fright. It was suspended from 60 feet by a hook which failed to release the load on cue, leaving the piano to just clumsily dangle around in the air for ages. It's a shame that the glass tower of 385 glasses had been filled with real champagne. At least that night wouldn't have been a complete write-off. However, later, why don't they just get it? Just go out there and someone give it a kick. However, later that same year, Rainer and Jonah managed to stage another attempt at the Gowanus Ballroom. Presumably, they still had some money left over. And this time, the results were a bit more worthy of celebration, resulting in a triumphant three minute video of the falling piano crashing into the glass from a range of different angles. And what did it sound like? Well, you're not too far off if you just try to imagine the sound of an old grand piano dropping from a height of 60 feet onto a glass tower constructed entirely of 385 champagne glasses. Yes, Danny, but what does it sound like? Raise a toast to Rainer and Jonah for completely validating our expectations on this one. The Zane is probably just going to sound really loud. There's going to be like the occasional bum 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 from a piano and tsh of glass. Well done, guys. 
well done. However, if it was this year, someone would have sold, like, made a video of it and sold the exclusive video as an NFT for like $7 million because sh is wild right now. <laughs> the Zeno drone. I thought it might be nice to finish on a positive note and take a look at Europe's most successful ever Kickstarter project, the Zeno drone. Well, they say most successful. What's this called? Kickstarter fails. Let me guess. Let me guess. It fails. <laughs> That's how it originally seemed during the first half of the year of the launch in 2015. Unfortunately, the whole project drifted off aimlessly into perhaps one of Kickstarter's biggest ever disasters, and there was no happy ending for any of the backers. Based in Pembroke Dock in southwest Wales, the talking group was founded by keen inventor Ivan Reedman, who had come up with something that seemed wondrously revolutionary at the time, particularly for people who enjoy taking endless selfies. So that's at least half the world's population right there as its target audience. The Dano drone was a palm-sized drone controlled by your smartphone it pitched on Kickstarter as an ultra-portable, autonomous, intelligent, and deployable HD video capture program. In 2015? <laughs> this should be wild. I mean, nowadays you get them from like that DJI company and they're really small and incredible. But that blew me away like a year ago. This, this, that was, this was five years before that. The promotional video showed happy mountain bikers and cliff divers and pub visitors all being lo loyally followed around by a tiny flashing friend recording their every moment. The pioneering new technology, which even came packaged with gesture control, was all ready to use right out of the box, all for a paltry £150 a pop. The original t funding goal on Kickstarter was set at a modest £125,000. That's what 150 pounds? Dude, it's super cheap. I just glossed over that. The target was hit within just 10 days, and in fact, the campaign went on to attract a staggering 2.3 million pounds in funding, far outstripping even the wildest expectations from this small Welsh company. I told you the target audience was big for this one. Yeah, because it's wildly impressive. But there was an issue. The talking group hadn't quite perfected the Zeno drone yet, and as the deadline came and went without any sign of the drone, it became clear that these were more than just minor teething problems. <clears throat> Is this one of those cases where they haven't actually made it, they haven't invented it? It's just like they had an idea for it, they designed it, and then they sold it, and then they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll figure out the making part later. And then they couldn't. Is someone gonna, someone's gonna get in big trouble for this, because, I mean, allegedly. Where does it become fraud? I mean, there's got to be some intent, right, to rip people off if it's actually fraud. I don't know. Look, look, let's just carry on and let's see what happens. The company just didn't seem capable of producing the gadget that they had pitched, and they were now snowed under with 15,000 orders from around the world, which they couldn't fulfill. Undeterred, the talking group plowed on regardless, and the Zeno drone became available to pre-order online long after the original Kickstarter campaign had reached the end of its funding period without much signs of success. However, quite surprisingly, 600 of these funds flying selfie drones were eventually dispatched to customers. But not to the Kickstarter customers, who had helped bring this product to life. From the original 15,000 backers, only four ever received a drone. Wait, did it work though? The other 596 were sent out to pre-order customers who had arrived late to the party, but jumped the queue by some considerable distance. Dude, that is unfair. That is really, that's really not on. Just to rub salt in the wounds, these pre-order customers were given an instant refund if they sent back their drones, whereas the original Kickstarter backers weren't getting anywhere with their own requests for a refund for a product that they still hadn't received. They weren't missing out on much with the Zeno drone, though. Those 600 customers who received a drone reported they'd spend £150 on useless piece, on a useless piece of shit. The drone, allegedly. The drone was only capable of making a few drunken bunny hops before crashing into the closest thing it could find. The video quality was dreadful. There was no sign of gesture control, and it seemed impossible for the device to stay airborne longer than a few seconds. Oh, what have you done? The talking company eventually collapsed. Surprise, surprise, after Ivan stepped down as CEO, citing personal health issues and irrecon irreconcilable differences. And any hope or prospect of delivering the promised drone to customers was abandoned. An independent investigation launched by Kickstarter concluded that the company and the product had been launched with honorable intentions, despite the fact that some elements of the promotional video were faked. Uh oh to make Zeno drone appear to be vaguely functional on some level. So that was a fucking lie. And some critics uh, suggest the Kickstarter themselves should shoulder a portion of the blame for not checking the promotional video was an authentic demonstration of the product. Does Kickstarter many make any guarantees? I mean, they'll I'm sure they say we'll do our best to take down anything that we think is not going to work. But they can't shoulder the blame. I mean, that opens them up to wild liability. But the main problem was that the campaign had been too successful in a way. The company had become overwhelmed with orders for a product that they hadn't quite figured out how to make, and they ended up going into panic mode and shipping orders of the only bit of junk they had on the table before getting swamped with refund requests. Nobody got rich from this mess. The company may have burned through the £2.3 million, but they also ran up another million pounds worth of debt in a desperate bid to create something that worked. This is sad. I mean, this... 
It would have been more entertaining, for sure, if it was like, yeah, yeah, they made a product, it did exist, and then they shipped out some piece of from China and they all knew about it. Instead, this is just a sad story of a business which started with good intentions and then went wrong, which is kind of sad for everyone rather than like, f those designers which is always more entertaining. But any back is still hoping for a refund from the most successful and most disastrous European Kickstarter compatible of all time, maybe waiting for a very long time. Maybe even until the end of the world. Nice callback, Danny. But a bub This has been an episode of Business Blaze. I have been your boy with the blaze. This OG BB shirt is not for sale. It was on sale for a month. It was a limited run, locking in your place as an OG BB. This is actually the first ever, first one, number one printing of the OG BB shirt. And uh, I, I only have one of these, so it's not going anywhere. Thank you for watching. Check out Squarespace, link below. If you'd like to check out the other merch as well, purchase the merch.co. And thank you for watching. Is Wayne Brady gonna have to choke a bitch?